Welcome to the Rights Track Podcast, where we aim to get the hard facts about the human rights challenges facing us today. I'm Todd Landman, and in today's episode, we're asking what is human development and in what ways is it related to the fulfillment of economic and social rights? My guest is Professor Sakiko Fukuda Par, formerly of the United Nations Development Program and key architect of the Human Development Index. Now, she is Professor the New School in New York City, working on development economics. So welcome, Sakiko. It's very nice to have you join us here. It's a great pleasure to be here. Thank you for inviting me. So it's great. Uh, you have worked for many years at the United Nations, uh, and uh, you know, one of the things that, that I mentioned is that you worked on this thing called the Human Development Index, and many of the people listening to our, our episodes on the Ryan's Track may not know what the Human Development Index is. So if you could briefly explain the sort of genesis of the Human Development Index, what, why was it needed and, and uh, sort of what purpose did it fulfill, but also uh, a bit more technically on how it was constructed and, and how it's useful for people who analyze this concept. The uh, Human Development Index was launched in 1990 in the Human Development Report, and this was the brainchild of Mahbub ul Haq former Minister of Finance and Planning of Pakistan, and somebody who believe deeply in development as something that must uh, improve the lives of people. Uh, since he had struggled as finance minister, planning minister, with accelerating economic growth and had considered that to be his primary objective, and yet started changing his mind and realizing that this really wasn't what, what he would call success, because while he achieved pretty good growth rates. He found that women were still illiterate, that people were living in poverty, and he said, we have to rethink this. And so he believed that the only way that you were going to get attention to the human ends of development, improving human lives as the real purpose of development, was by having a measurement tool, an index that would, in his words, rival the GDP as a measure of progress, a measure of development. This is gross domestic product of a country. It's a standard measure that economists use, uh, and it just means the total goods and services produced uh, uh, in, the, in a country. Um, but unfortunately, the economists have focused on sort of percentage change of that number uh, between one year and the next as a measure of, of economic success. So this really challenged that notion and said that our concept of development needs to be bigger, uh, and it needs to involve this this notion of human flourishing uh, and perhaps even uh, you know sort of freedom and agency to do things uh, within an economy and and that sort of concept at least underlay much of the work then on on the index itself is that right yes absolutely so Mahbub partnered with Amartya Sen to help him devise these reports the human development reports that would analyze current development situations and challenges from this perspective of human well-being and human flourishing, as you described so nicely, um, and also to devise a measure. And uh, Amartya Sen, at that time, in the 1980s, had been working on his theory of capability expansion as development and defining exactly what human well-being are actually meant. We all have different ideas about what human well-being is. Conventional economists have used the, 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 this uh, concept of utility maximization. And he challenged that to say, well, you know, the real purpose of uh, human well-being would be, should be considered in terms of freedom. And not just freedom from other people stopping you from doing things or the freedom to do whatever you want to do, uh, which might even be some bad things, but to the freedom to lead the life the kind of life that you, you value, to be and to do the things that you value. And so he has this theory of capabilities and functioning. Uh, so this is the deep conceptual sort of philosophical basis on which the human development concept is founded. Amartya Sen uh, was persuaded to develop a, a measure because uh, Amartya argued that uh, you can't really measure this thing called capabilities. Uh, it's just much too complex. Uh, but he was persuaded that this was an important thing to do for the purposes of changing people's minds, changing policy makers' perspectives on how you evaluate progress. So then you have to uh, go from the conceptual to the methodological and the operational. So 
Um, how, how was this concept of human development operationalized by the United Nations? Well, the Human Development Index ultimately is a very simple one. You just say to yourself, you know, what are the things that are universally valued uh, by people and yet that are deprived? And so things like being able to le read actually is a fundamental capability, what Amartya calls a capability, because it also opens up your freedom to do many, many things. It, it opens up access to knowledge. Being uh, schooled is similarly is the same thing. Being able to survive, uh, you know, and to lead a healthy life, that's another thing. So, you know, one proceeded in this way to identify fundamentally important capabilities that are universal. That is not just important for you, Todd, but for me and the 7 billion people around the world. Absolutely. <laughs> and <laughs> having identified those three things, one, you know, made a rather simple mathematical formula for uh, looking at achievements in these uh, areas and finding indicators to do that. And so the Human Development Index, in terms of its, its, its sort of uh, qualities, it ranges from zero to one, where one is a, a sort of good score and zero, not a good score. But when, when you're looking at countries around the world, uh, you know, uh, what, 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 was, what was it used for and, and how, how was it used to compare nations in, in, in that sense? Well, I think this is where you see how measurement tools, theoretical concepts, policy change come together. You have an index like the Human Development Index, HDI, used within the context of an analytical report to illustrate what kinds of policies advance people's interests and well-being, defined as capabilities in this sense, and what policies do not. The other part of it was that the countries were ranked. It was the first time that the United Nations published a report in which you had this statistical data used and put into an index that was not just put at the back as an annex, almost like a telephone directory fashion, where you had to go and find your country. The countries were ranked by performance and achievement. And this, of course, then spoke directly to policymakers who then began to pay attention. And it wasn't just the ministries of uh, health and education who began to pay attention, but prime ministers, presidents, ministers of finance. So then um, it had a very important effect in, number one, highlighting attention of countries on whether they had actually made progress in improving lives of people in a very fundamental way, but also opening that conversation about why it was important to look at the HDI and not just the GDP per capita. That's really interesting. So uh, income is one part of the HDI and therefore the HDI is highly correlated with uh, uh, GDP, but not perfectly. So you could have, uh, let's say, a wealthy country that hadn't uh, necessarily a one-to-one -one relationship with its HDI and, and, and let's say a, a, you know, a less developed country uh, in terms of per capita GDP that, that did in the sense that it was around the governance and around the use of resource and the ways in which those are deployed uh, getting, getting education and, 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 and uh, health outcomes improved. Is that right? Yes. In fact, for those of us who were working on the report, it was the very last column of the HDI tables that was most important. That is the difference between the rank of a country according to the HDI and the rank of a country according to GDP per capita. So you could see that a country that would rank well under GDP per capita uh, did much less well under HDI and vice versa. So, for example, Cuba would do much better in terms of ranking under HDI than uh, GDP. Similarly, Costa Rica. And so you can see, in a way, how countries did in using their economic resources to deliver better lives for people. And so that, that kind of gap analysis and that, that literally a, almost a relativization of, of scoring and ranking must have influenced uh, the next step of your work or the next stage of your work around this fulfillment index, right? Because you you then turned your attention to economic and social rights. So um, I'm curious, A, what is your understanding of economic and social rights? Uh, and B, how did you operationalize those for 
for the kind of work that you're doing in terms of creating indexes around around those sets of rights? The essential difference between human rights and human development is that human rights impose correlate obligations on duty bearers. And whereas human development is an aspirational notion. And so the value added of uh, human rights perspectives in social analysis and evaluation is that to see, to ask, what is society doing to put in place the institutions necessary to fulfill economic and social rights, well, human rights, including economic and social rights. If you have resources, and if you are the state, who, which the state is, is obviously identified as the primary duty bearer, uh, if what is the state doing with the resources available to fulfill economic and social rights. I mean, that's the core concept uh, behind the Social and Economic Rights Fulfillment Index that Susan Randolph, Tara Lawson, Raymer, and I developed and published recently. So what was your personal motivation for getting involved in setting up the index for human rights? Because of a conceptual interest in human rights as something that was very much related to human development. In fact, in the 2000 Human Development Report, we argued that human rights and human development were two sides of the same coin because they have the same motivation to expand freedoms and dignity of, of people. And we had a common cause. Promotion of human rights and the promotion of human development required alternative development strategies to those being pursued, which uh, from the 1990s, which was basically one of liberalization, privatization. So, so remember that the, the human development report and the whole idea of human development as the important way of looking at development started in 1990 in a context of very active debates about structural adjustment programs and the effects of liberalization and privatization led you know, that's, that was opened up by the uh, Reagan-Thatcher revolution, and that has led to the increasing uh, globalization. So that's the sort of the backdrop uh, that we were looking for a way of uh, promoting strategies for development that did not uh, sacrifice on the human costs of economic policy reforms. The sort of tenor of that policy shift, at least during Reagan-Thatcher, was that somehow pricing mechanisms would be all that was needed to allocate resources within a society where, where the, the, you know, the, the race to the bottom, as it were, was the best way to allocate uh, goods and services, and yet people would fall through the gaps. And so the UN, in a way, challenged that and said, you know, we need to focus on the overall outcomes and, and not necessarily look at just pricing mechanisms for that distribution. And, and that was a major tension during that period, I think, between, uh, between the so-called Washington consensus and, and the human development agenda. Yes, exactly. So at the time, one of the important objectives was to stabilize the macroeconomic situation by rather rigorous macroeconomic policies, uh, such as balancing budgets. Uh, this meant cuts in education, health, it meant imposing user fees, and so the consequences of that, for example, for children's lives uh, were very severe, and this was all documented by UNICEF's book, uh, Adjustment with a Human Face, and that argued that you could have, there was a different way in which you could have better economic uh, stabilization as well uh, without such consequences for children. And I think we have some of the same debates going on about austerity and stability in countries like Greece, for example. In what ways has the Human Development Index become the SURF Index? The Human Development Index is a measure of overall achievements. It does not take account of this issue of government obligations and whether the human rights question of whether governments are complying with their obligations to fulfill economic and social rights. With the analysis that we had done looking at the different achievements that countries with similar resources had, so, you know, high human development in Cuba, 
low human development, for example, in Guatemala, even though they may have had similar levels of income. Same thing with the contrast between Brazil and South Africa, two countries with similar levels of income and very different levels of human development. That, that Those contra contrasts we thought were quite fundamental in uh, differentiating human development from human rights and that we thought that a measure of human rights could not be just human development index. And as you said, Todd, there is a rough sort of relationship between GDP per capita and socioeconomic achievements like, you know, reducing malnutrition or increasing literacy. And yet there is a huge dispersion that, yes, the United States has higher levels of uh, life expectancy than Burkina Faso. But that really wasn't the contrast that, that we were looking for. Uh, that so told you very little about the obligation of government. Because how can you say, oh, the United States government is doing very well in uh, fulfilling uh, right to education because look, they've achieved, for example, just about 100% primary school enrollment, whereas Burkina Faso has not. Given that these two countries have just vastly different levels of resources. And so we thought that the real issue was what countries were doing with the resources that they had. This is obviously not the only uh, dimension of uh, government obligations, but it is a very fundamental one because the obligation under human rights law is to progressively realize economic and social rights, in fact, all rights, but it's very explicit in the International Covenant on Economic and Social Rights that these rights are to be progressively realized to the maximum of, of available resources. And some people interpret the maximum of resources to mean government spend as much as they can. Well, that is a relevant interpretation and, and implication of this, this clause. But the other interpretation and implication of this clause is that you have to take account of real resource constraints. Yes, so it's not all about how much you spend or maximizing expenditure, but it's about where you place your emphasis, what your priorities are, and how you address the needs of the population. Yes. So how did this then become an index? For about 10 years, there was an enormous amount of discussion internationally, maybe before 2000 actually, about human rights measurement. And that was just beginning, uh, particularly in economic and social rights. And the special rapporteur for economic and social rights, Danilo Turk, wrote a, a report, a special rapporteur, saying, you know, you really had to have measurement because economic and social rights were things that had to be fulfilled, not just respected, protected, but fulfilled so, uh, and to the maximum of available resources. And you needed some sort of a measurement. And a lot of people had thrown up their hands and said, this is much too complicated because there are just too many rights and too many dimensions. Well, most of those people in the human rights measurement debates were actually human rights practitioners or theorists who came from either a philosophy or legal backgrounds. And they were used to a methodology of human rights analysis, which is case by case. They were not used to using data. Susan Terra and I come from an economics background. So this was our toolbox to use data to make overall assessments of whether things were getting better or worse. And so the three of us were not at all baffled by the need to make an index because we said, well, you know, there are many things that you can actually do to measure. And first, to start off with, uh, you want an overall measure, not just whether the right to non-discrimination in education was being fulfilled. Or I mean, it's, it was just an overall measure. In the same way that Human Development Index is an overall summary measure, you, you cannot 
say whether things are getting better or worse in any country, whether it is, uh, even if it is in Syria or Iran or Turkey or Guatemala or the United States, by just looking at particular incidents. You need to have some kind of an aggregation. So the unit of analysis has to move beyond the one person and the one case. It has to move to an aggregated uh, group level of the uh, the rights of the entire population of a country or a sub-region of a country or group within a country. So you had to have this level of aggregation uh, across individual rights holders. Presumably you needed some kind of aggregation or summation across the dimensions of human rights norms. You had to have something like the right to food that encompasses physical availability, economic accessibility, quality, cultural appropriateness, and, and so forth. So you have to be able to make a general summary statement. And this is essentially what the Human Development Index was all about. And, and the Human Development Index was originally criticized for, you know, being much too kind of broad and much too general and missing so many other things uh, that we can say are missing from there. Uh, and yet, its power actually came from the fact that it was an aggregated uh, index that gave you a kind of a general summary view of where things were heading. And, and that allowed you to say whether things were getting worse or better and how big the problem was. And it's essentially the same idea with a human uh, with this human rights index that, that we wanted something that gave this overall picture. And that overall picture combines a number of different factors and just like the HDI you combine them together and then you have one score in this case ranging from from zero to 100. Uh, so, so it's equivalent, uh, uh, analogous I should say, but slightly different in that the components that make that up are different. Can you can you talk us through the components of the SURF Index then? So the components of the Social Economic um, Rights Fulfillment Index, the SURF Index, are drawn from the normative principles of international human rights law. And so the SURF Index refers to the core rights spelled out in the International Covenant on Economic, Social, Cultural Rights Therefore, the right to food, the right to housing, the right to health, the right to work, the right to social security. And so these are combined in a way that, that uses this thing you call the achievement possibility frontier, which I, I like that concept because it comes from the sort of production possibility frontier out of economics. But you, you call this the achievement possibility frontier, which I really like. So this is this, this ideal notion of uh, what should be achieved, all things being equal. Uh, versus what's actually achieved, and that and that then sits at the basis, the foundation, if you will, of uh, of a score. So if we take a country that has a score of uh, 65 versus a country that has 85, it's immediately apparent that the 85 country is achieving or fulfilling more of that frontier, if you will, uh, than a country with 65, right? Exactly. So the achie the production possibility frontier for the economists in the audience is a very straightforward, simple, intuitive, and basic concept in economics. I think that it's something that you you study in Economics 101. And as you said, I mean, it's basically a uh, the a production possibilities frontier of what you can produce given a set of inputs, uh, given two inputs, I guess. And so uh, the same analogous concept can be applied to looking at the relationship between resources and rights fulfillment. So if you think in terms of a scattergram, you can put years of schooling on one axis, the left-hand axis, and then you can put GDP per capita using data of PPP data, of course, uh, comparable data across countries that adjust for differences in uh, exchange rates. So you put that on the uh, horizontal line and you see for each level of income what countries have achieved in terms of let's say the right to health or the right to food or the right to education 
And then what you notice is that there is this very large spread of achievements that some countries, even with very low levels of income, have achieved a great deal. Can you give us an example of what you might see and what conclusions you might draw from what you see? I think that some countries like, let's say, I think Tanzania is a good country that has achieved much higher levels of education than some of its neighboring African countries with the same level of per capita income. But you can see much more systematically what that relationship is by drawing what we call this achievement possibilities frontier. What we mean is the rights enjoyment achievement possibilities frontier. And you can see that you can draw this line right at the top of these observations, what the the highest level, let's say, of, of reducing stunting, uh, which would reflect the right to food. And how have you used it to look at and compare the performance of different countries? What we did is to find data for 25 years for every single country in the world that for which you know the, 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 the data were available. And we produce this scattergram, and then you draw this line uh, that uh, over the maximum achievement uh, and then that draw that allows you to see that if you are really trying, <laughs> this is given resources, given the state of technology that is available and, and taken into account all these constraints, what it is that has been achieved. And the distance between your level of achievement and that maximal that had ever been achieved historically over the last 25 years uh, by any country at, at that given level of income gives you a sense of what that maximum could be. And that shortfall is the shortfall in your, uh, your compliance with the obligation to do your utmost to take all the measures you could possibly take to fulfill that right. And so this has been a real uh, a sort of breaking or cracking the code in the way, because for years there have been debates about, well, one could never really measure economic and social rights because it all depends on uh, the relative wealth of a country and its its progress, et cetera. And yet here you've been able to relativize and, and make comparable uh, this achievement possibility frontier. So it's possible to compare wealthy countries next to less wealthy countries uh, in GDP terms, and yet still have something meaningful to say about that comparison with respect to the, the fulfillment of economic uh, and social rights. So it really is a next phase in our understanding of how to measure and compare human rights. And I guess one of the, the final questions I have for you is, how much do these things change over time? So the, the, the achievement possibility frontier, is this something that varies quickly over time, or does this take take a bit of time, because there's a certain impatience, if you will, in the policy world about achieving particular objectives like the Millennium Development Goals, for example, uh, or other goals that we set ourselves. I think countries can move uh, quickly over time, and I think that's about the one of the messages of, of this analysis is that, indeed, there is resources is not, a, uh, not an excuse for non-fulfillment of uh, economic and social rights because you see this that the vast majority of countries are well below this maximum possible so even given the resources that they have it should in theory be possible to move move up now of course this is like any index of this kind it is only a, sort of a highly simplified picture that doesn't uh, reflect uh, every single constraint the country can be facing beyond a GDP per capita uh, you may have a problem, for example, with uh, Ebola, you know, epidemic, things of that kind that makes, that compromises your ability to fulfill the right to health. But uh, this index is a sort of a beginning of a more rigorous understanding and analysis of what the challenges are and what the possibilities are. That's the way that uh, I think this, this should be used. And you identify the key innovation in this that it allows you to measure against a relative standard which is this this idea of uh, obligation to fulfill to the maximum of available resources. And this is great because it, not only is it relative but it's rather optimistic so I was struck by your, 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 your answer there and you said well actually given the level of resource there are a lot of countries falling below that achievement possibility and that suggests that there's 
things that can be done today to change a situation. And I think that's a very optimistic message coming out of this that I hadn't, I hadn't heard before when people look at this. They sort of look at this and look at the gaps, etc. But you're actually suggesting that, well, you know, the, the resource is there. You just need to make more of it. Uh, and when more resource comes, you can make more of that too. So I think it's a really, really interesting way uh, to interpret the, the data. And, and you also suggest that the data are there for further analysis. So, you know, uh, in the, the language of a social scientist, the surf index becomes a very interesting dependent variable, something that needs to be explained, right? Uh, so this variation, yeah, this variation across the world, like we, we use measures of civil and political rights, we can now use measures of, of economic and social rights in the ways you've, you've constructed them. So, um, I wanted to uh, just thank you very much for sharing all your insights with us today. Um, I think the evolution from the Human Development Index, on which you've worked for many, many years, your thinking around the SURF Index, the collaborators that you mentioned uh, today, and the, the, the deep insight that this work has, is already providing uh, and deepening our understanding of the fulfillment of, of social and economic rights. So I think this has been a really, really helpful discussion in that regard. And, uh, on behalf of the Rights Track, can I thank you, Sakiko, for joining us in this episode. This episode of the Rights Track was presented by Todd Landman and produced by Chris Garrington of Research Podcasts. The podcast project is funded by the Nuffield Foundation, and you can find additional information and resources at www.rightstrack.org. <laughs>